All right, welcome everyone. We're just a couple minutes after noon, so I hope everybody is settled in and ready to begin our sixth, I think it is, uh, digital round table since COVID hit. So thank you all for carving out time to join us this afternoon. First and foremost, I hope that everyone on the line is staying safe, healthy, and as sane as possible. I know that these are very challenging times. Before we jump right into it, I wanna go through a few rules of engagement. So this session is being recorded. We intend to share it on our website after the fact and you'll all receive a copy. So if you wanna share it with any of your colleagues, you're more than welcome to do so. I would love to encourage everyone to go on video if you're up for that. So um, you can just go uh, to the bottom of your screen on the left-hand sure. side, you should see. Uh, you should see the uh, video option if you're comfortable with that that way it makes it more engaging but if you aren't comfortable with that that's no problem you might recall that we asked you to fill out some questions if you had any for our panelists uh, in advance when you were registering so we do plan to ask some of those throughout the conversation today we've pre-selected some of those and we've grouped some together because we had some questions that were asked multiple times. And so if you're on the line, I will ask if you're comfortable uh, to, to come forward, go on video and unmute your line and to ask your question to the group. And then we will throw it to our speakers and hopefully we can have a dynamic conversation. There's also a chat feature, so please go ahead and introduce yourself to the group or ask questions throughout as they come to mind and I'll be monitoring that throughout. Now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Carly Silverstein and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Redstone Agency. We are a full service event and association management company. Um, like I mentioned, this is our sixth digital event since COVID broke out and our intention with these are to bring like-minded people together to connect during this uncertain time and to share relevant and valuable information and ideas really. No one has all the answers and I think bringing people together um, just will help all of us get through this time together. Over the past several weeks, we've been working with our clients to evaluate the COVID situation and to make quick but mindful decisions about what they should and shouldn't be doing during this time, how and when they should be communicating, you don't want to appear tone deaf, uh, what the messaging is, and all of that. The reality is, as I mentioned, is that these are unprecedented times, and I think it's fair to say that none of us have any or all of the answers. But there are a lot of questions. So we've pulled together speakers from a variety of different industries, but they all have something in common, strength and community building in good times and in challenging times. So we've invited a few speakers today and I wanna quickly tell you who they are, but then I'll pass it over to them so that they can give you a more wholesome introduction. So we have Kara Krezik, the president of CWIL, which is a cooperative education and work integrated learning um, Canada. We have Alana Kafitz, the founder and CEO of Moms Toronto, and Tristan Hightower, Director of Global Chapter and Special Interest Group Operations for the International Game Developers Association. Welcome and thank, thanks to all of you for sparing some time to be with us today. I know that our audience is very excited and looking forward to hearing from you. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna pass it over to our speakers and I'm gonna stop talking for a little while. So Kara, let's start with you. So good afternoon, everybody. I was having a bit of internet uh, stability issues. So if I start going in and out, just message me and I'll pass it over to somebody else if uh, for some reason the stability is off. Um, so as Carly mentioned, my name is Kara Krezik. I am the president of Sewell Canada, uh, which is an organization made up of uh, post-secondary institutions and employers from across the country. We have uh, a little bit over almost 1,100 members and I represent over 100 at the same time as blending with my full-time job, uh, which is I'm a director at uh, Brock University, the director of co-op career and experiential education. Those two things have completely blended uh, during this time and we are, um, yeah, it's been a, a really, uh, quick, I'd say, turnaround with our organization. Uh, we are a volunteer organization. And as well, we um, 
I say like I'm really good in managing in, in chaos so that was really helpful during this time to make some decisions as it required some really quick um, uh, abilities to, to make decisions our board was great about getting together and being able to do some of those really quick actions that we can get into after if, if you'd like but those were um, some of the things that we did and uh, happy to be here today and, and share a little bit of our Seville story. Awesome, thanks, we're thrilled to have you with us. Alana, over to you for brief introductions. Hi everybody, my name is Alana Capitz. I'm the CEO and founder of Moms Toronto. Is there my sign? There's my sign. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, what do I do? I do a lot of things. I'm the founder of Moms Toronto. We are like a soup to nuts, um, uh, community-based uh, organization that is on one mission and our mission is to give moms a great day. We target primarily millennial moms on maternity leave or parents with kids under two. We run really cool live events in person and online. So um, the online is capital O these days. Um, so uh, as we move toward, uh, you know, pivoting strategies that are the uh, bulk of the topic of this round table discussion, we sort of always been at the forefront of like a digital online community. So it wasn't a, a gigantic pivot, but I would say our community and our business was probably 60, 40 live digital. And now we're basically a hundred percent digital. So I look forward into uh, drilling down into that a little bit more. And thanks for having me. We're very excited to have you. I think uh, compared to the other speakers, you're not uh, a trader professional association, but membership organization. So I think you have a lot to share and a unique perspective. So we'll dive deeper in a few moments. Trist, pleasure. Tristan, over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Tristan Hightower. Uh, I am the director of global chapter and SIG operations with the International Game Developers Association, which is a very long mouthful, but I figured I should spell it out as opposed to use acronyms so you knew what I, where I was. Um, my focus is on, my focus and my job is on our communities. Um, we have, we're an international organization. We have over 120 chapters um, around the world. And then we have 25 or so special interest groups that are more of a virtual community that spans things such as um, industry focus, their affinity type groups um, and things like that. So we have um, people who of SIG around writing in the game, in, in the game industry. Um, that's more of a, a discipline focus versus um, women in games, black in games, LGBTQ in games. Um, those are more affinity and advocacy related special interest groups. Um, and it's, it's uh for me it is the I, I love my job and what i do with working with those communities um and so i'm looking forward to hopefully sharing some insights working with them with you amazing thank you so now that you know who we've brought to speak with us today we're going to dive into some of the ways that they've built community they continue the momentum even through these challenging times. So Kara, we'll start with you. Um, I have a little bit of insight into your organization over the past couple of years and specifically over the past couple of weeks. I'm gonna say, I think uh, objectively, you've done an amazing job building community, growing your membership even pre-COVID. However, tell us a little bit about how Seawell has been able to react quickly, embrace and build your community during this difficult time. Hey, thanks. Uh, so I got kicked off for a second, so I just jumped back in. It's one of those Murphy laws, I think, right now. Um, so I think uh, what we did really quickly was, and I mentioned this a little bit before, was that we were able to respond pretty quickly what was happening. I think that talks about uh, some of the, the um, as everything was building over that week in March, and I keep thinking about it on March, it was Friday the 13th, and we had heard that a large organization was going to cancel um, a, a, a quite a few uh, co-op opportunities for students. And we knew that as soon as one, was, this was gonna happen, that this could affect our entire membership. So we jumped on a call really quickly, and um, were able to make a decision about um, moving 
uh, work terms to June if that was a, a opportunity for an employer as opposed to them because so much was happening at that time that people being able to make some decisions to give them some breathing room that was one of our, our first decisions that we made and I think that what it set us down this path was, was um, being looked to for leadership from a variety of people. And that was a really great opportunity for us. And I, I say that in retrospect at the time, it just seemed like something we needed to do at that time. And then we put out an announcement about recommending that instead of uh, employers canceling uh, student opportunities this summer, that instead they just move them or that they um, allow that student to be onboarded from home. Uh, the really interesting thing was, as this was happening, it was our first ever um, Work Integrated Learning Month, which we were working with Redstone on. And we had a whole social campaign. It used to be a, a week and we turned it into a month and we did this whole campaign and it, it was like hashtag was willpower. And all of a sudden in the middle of this huge month that we were making these big announcements, this happened. So we had to pivot really quickly with some of these Oh, Kara, I think that we lost you there for a second. Okay. Decisions, but what, am I back or no? You're, you're back, you're okay. back. So I, I, we basically, in the middle of our, our month, we switched and we had to make some, as we made some decisions. And as we were making those decisions, we um, invited more people into our community. And we basically said, as long as you are somebody who has an interest in will, come along with us. And we opened up uh, our calls that we do weekly. We were sending out resources and really just making sure that anybody, whether they were a member or not, was brought along because um, into the conversation and we were inviting everybody and we continue to do that. Uh, so those were some of the things that we've done to build community. I can answer questions later about what that means for our membership going forward, but at the time, and we're still in this time where we just want to make sure that we are providing resources and value to everybody that, it, that this is affecting. And then we will work through the details of some of those pieces later. Amazing. Thank you. Yes, there are some questions that came through, so we'll get to those and I think you'll touch upon it uh, a little bit later. But I think the fact that you're bringing in fresh blood or, or new people who may not have been in the community prior to this, um, I, I think that's inspiring to some people in terms of how to get new members or how to grow that community. So we'll circle back. Thanks so much, Kara. Moving on, I'd like to ask a question of Alana. So some would dub you as the queen of community. Can you tell us a little bit about the strategies you used pre-COVID-19 and how you've had to adjust over the past few weeks, considering you mentioned that your business model was predominantly building community in person, um, giving uh, people unique experiences and live events? Yeah, um, so that is the best title ever. Can you write that somewhere so I can put it on social media? The queen of building community. I saw that in the notes and I was like, love that. Um, yeah, look, I have a long history of like building community. It's what I've sort of always done. Um, nonprofit and then sort of uh, professionally now for myself. But the pivot has been for me really trying to be creative when it comes to experiences. And uh, I mean, Carly, I can dress here, like we have really tried hard to lean into our authentic voice and to meet our members where they're at. And we have a very niche community, like we have young parents, uh, primarily moms. And my community is basically based in moms who are business owners, who are looking for aspirational, inspirational, kick-ass um, skill sets to grow their business, whether or not it's online or in person. And like your regular mom, like just an average mom who is looking to connect with other moms. Um, and uh, we really did have a strong in-person community, which is where our forte is. And we really sing when we're live. Um, it's so ironic. Next week, we were supposed to have a multi-hundred person event, really boutique, really unique, uh, um, a summit or conference of some nature um, that we obviously had to pivot away from. And... Uh, I think what was interesting about our ability to pivot quickly was that 
we're not strangers to the online community space and our like paid membership community is called the mom halo and our halo members are sort of diehard members of our community anyway and we already had a few strategies in place um like just technology that was available to us and we are always using them in creative ways so for an example would you like me to give the examples here is that a good place to do it go for it okay yeah, so for example of course, people traditionally have something like a Facebook page, but a lot of millennial moms are not on Facebook. So as a result to that, we actually have a very active and thriving WhatsApp channel. And the WhatsApp channel is literally women connecting all day, every day in real time. And it feels different and separate and almost more special than you might see in a traditional um, Facebook page. And it's not a Slack channel, so it's not necessarily a workflow piece. So it feels really like a group of girlfriends, if you know what I mean. Um, and I love this community. They're constantly supporting each other, answering each other's questions all day long. Uh, and that's really special. And that's only like, that's a safeguarded place just for our card carrying members. Um, beyond that, we actually just did our first live event virtually on Monday. Um, and we had a few hundred people register and a few hundred people attend. But for those card carrying members, we went above and beyond the call of duty. Um, and we actually fulfilled experiential swag bags um, and hand delivered those to those members to make sure that they had a really special experience. Um, and we made sure that like, I think there's something to be said when you're recording the Zoom call like we are now, but there's something to be said when people are told to take social um, media um, action. So we, the call to action was to take a photo of yourself watching the video or wearing the swag of whatever we were doing. I think I wore this at some point in the party. Um, you know, we really tried to make it fun um, and bring that life to the event. And um, one thing we've really been employing for quite some time actually is Spotify. We really think that music elevates all experiences. So we actually have a Spotify playlist that we send out every single month. But now we're really incorporating music anytime we can to really make people feel as connected as possible. So I think that's how we really were able to move quickly and uh, not perfectly, but quickly to a to a solution that was awesome um in terms of bringing people together in a way that's really really connected i love that and i love that you hand delivered the swag bags i think that going back to basics or archaic times the snail mail i know you hand delivered them but the the thought of you know mailing something out or using a career service to, to do something like that as the world goes more and more virtual. I think giving something that builds community even while we're behind our screens, like the hat that you just put on, if everyone was wearing something unifying or if there was, uh, you know, we were doing a mixology course and we all had the same ingredients and you could do something engaging that way. I think that's a really, really uh, great piece and that everyone should consider if budget allows, um, if they're taking their events online. Wonderful points, thank you so much. Yeah, and I think for Carly, one thing we did that I thought was really cute, we actually had like a theme, like a dress theme. So we yeah. told people to come in yellow. You can see all of our panelists are wearing black primarily today. Yeah. I find everyone shows up on social right now or in virtual events in like very basic colors, probably not wearing pants, you know, that sort of joke. Yeah. But we wanted everyone to wear yellow. So we actually sent everybody a yellow a bandana and a yellow scrunchie. Nice. So you really saw the punch of color when people were coming up online. And there's really creative ways that you can literally take experiential marketing and event-based um, uh, community and right now really be creative. So if anyone else has creative ideas, I'm open. I'm happy to be an open book and share all of our um, kimono secret sauces. But yeah, I, I love the idea of people really just pushing the envelope and doing things that are just think, just put yourself in the shoes of the consumer. Like if we are going analog, what do they want to hear? What do they want to see? What do they want to feel? Amazing. And I know that lots of people will have questions for you about your creative ideas. So we can we can get back to that question a little bit later. Um, let's move on to Tristan. Um, Tristan, you started with IGDA as a volunteer and I just want to stop and appreciate and thank all the volunteers that we have on the line today. It is actually National Volunteer Week. So round of applause for all of you. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, both Kara and Tristan are part of volunteer run not-for-profit organizations and they, um, they thrive and grow on the backs of blood, sweat, and tears, hopefully not too many tears, um, on the backs of volunteers. So I just wanted to acknowledge volunteers and then also let you know that 
Tristan started with IGDA in a volunteer capacity, I think a number of years ago. And then now you are um, in this director role on staff with the organization. So um, for everyone on the line now that's talking about engagement and building their communities and building their associations, how did you first become involved in the organization way back when? And then how did the organization engage you to a point that you, you know, lived and breathed by their mission and, and wanted to join them in a full-time capacity? Sure. So I, so the IGD is a professional member-based association um, for people who are in the game development industry, people who make games. Um, and I was hired into a role that put me into that industry um, in a, around 2007, I believe. And, you know, I, I'm a gamer. I've been a gamer my whole life. I had never thought about actually being involved in the creation of games until I got into this space. Um, I came from the dot com. I came, I came from the dot com world. Um, and so when I moved in, my, for me, it immediately was research. You know, now I'm in the game industry. I know nothing about this, this world that I've entered. And the IGDA was, the, the industry that was the is the professional association for the industry. So, um, you know, work signed us work signed me up for a membership to the organization um, so that I could learn and get involved. And, um, you know, through that, um, I was a lurker for a very long time. Um, people who don't know me super well will be shocked to hear that I'm actually very introverted. <laughs> so I lurked for a very long time reading and absorbing and trying to figure out what was going on. And through communications from the organization, you know, I learned about my local chapter um, and I signed up and lurked there for a while. And I learned about our special interest groups. And the first one that I gravitated toward was the women in games one, because I'm an introvert and I felt so unsure of where I was in this industry, you know, and back then, and even still now, you know, games are, considered to be a male dominated field and so i felt like the women in games special interest group would be kind of a safe space for me to lurk and maybe try to come out of my comfort zone and ask questions um and i did i lurked and just watched for a very long time and eventually uh the women in games special interest group had published a communication that they were looking for new leadership and new volunteers um, because we are volunteer, because it's a volunteer run org, you know, the people who were running it, they, it was, they want, they needed to, you know, rotate off, do other things, real life comes up. Um, and in order to get out of my lurkiness, I decided to step up and volunteer for this, the SIG, uh, in whatever way that I could. And it kind of snowballed from there. Um, I was a volunteer and then I was on the steering committee and then I started attending the local chapter meetings and the local chapter was, um, it was, it was good, but it was having some difficult, it was struggling in some ways, you know, as a volunteer run organization, things can are only as good as, you know, volunteers can, as we can support them the best they can, but the volunteers, depending on their skill sets, depending on their time, depending on what happens, um, you know, the, the chapter was struggling a little bit and I put on my, we're going to do this hat and kind of jumped in heads first into the chapter. And the next thing I knew I was leading the chapter, um, and really trying to revive and bring that community back together. And it was through all of that volunteering that I got to learn. I got to connect with people around the world who were also leading chapters, um, to help. We were helping each other. How do you do this? And how do you do that? And I also became more involved with with HQ because they were developing resources to support their cha our chapters and things like that and they brought me in to help start supporting in that way um, and the next thing you know probably five six years later um, a job opening at HQ uh, opened that was related to um, the communities uh, that the org had and I was so eyeballs deep in all of that already that people encouraged me um people encouraged me to run you know apply for the role and i did so and now i'm on staff <laughs> and i've been here for six years um 
I think, you know, I don't know if there's anything about that that you want me to get into or elaborate on, but that's kind of the story of how I went from volunteer to, uh, to staff. I think that's very inspirational to many on the line who are some are, are just one, grappling with how do they engage new members um, in general. And then once you do get them in, how do you start to get them involved, you know, on a micro level and then, you know, more fully similar to the trajectory that you explained taking. But I think that you stand as an inspiration and as an example that um, it is possible and that you can do a complete 180 where you're starting off as you know, just dabbling in or even being in the background lurking as you, as you called it, all the way to, you know, being on staff and now you're leading the charge um, where you were once uh, just volunteering at the chapter level. So I think that's very inspirational. We're going to move on to a few of the questions that were submitted previously by the attendees. So first up, I want to see if we have Leah Benford on the line. Yes, I'm here. Sorry, I'll turn my camera back on. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for, your, for having this. If you are comfortable, it seems as you are, if you would like to ask uh, your question to our panel. Absolutely. So um, I, I'm coming from a, a smaller not-for-profit in Sudbury, Ontario, um, and we have fee-for-service programs that are membership-based. So our biggest question and our biggest challenge that we're dealing with right now is how do we get people to pay to renew memberships given everything that's going on? It's a great question and you're not alone with it. We have been at working with our clients to kind of evaluate what value um, they're going to be able to bring in this time. As Alana mentioned, her business is pretty, was pretty well live event. And so, you know, we can't congregate. We're all self-isolating at home. So we've had to pivot. And the same goes for many of our not-for-profit associations where they've had to cancel or postpone some of their events. So we're kind of seeing two camps uh, two frames of thought on this. One is, you know, community means more or the associations mean more um, now than ever, similar to the title of this session, meaning that this is the place where they'll congregate, get ideas, and they'll seek so much value at this time of need from their membership organization. And so they should be paying, uh, definitely. And then there's on the other side where depending on what industry you're in, some have been more hard hit than others. Um, and they're saying, no, you know, it's not appropriate. It's tone deaf. It's not being empathetic to the situation that some of our members are finding themselves in. We're not going to do any kind of follow up on membership dues or even ask for membership uh, to be paid through till 2021. So we've definitely seen uh, people take stances on both sides and there's, you know, valid arguments uh, in favor of both. I think that I'll pass it over to Kara to give an example um, of what Seawill has done and how they plan to um, you know, what the strategy going forward and coming out of COVID will be based on the decisions they've made right now. Kara, over to you. Thanks. So I think it's interesting because it wasn't a big decision that we made to, to include people. It was just kind of happenstance uh, in the chaos that we were in, that we, uh, as we were being reached out to by more and more people and um, engaging, we were hearing, at first we were just uh, uh, engaging with our directors and managers from institutions and organizations. And then we realized we needed to bring that broader to the practitioners, those that were dealing with students and employers directly. And then we were thinking, well, there's more people in the fold with like-minding associations and, and organizations. So we just were welcoming and building that community and saying, if you're part of this community, you're part of this conversation right now. And because of some of the decisions, we are an accrediting body uh, in that we accredit co-op. Um, there's nine different types of work integrated learning, but we accredit co-op uh, specifically. So some were looking to us for because of the accreditation and others were just because we have during Will Month, for example, we had launched our Quality Council. We had launched um, a couple of initiatives that showed the leadership that we have and our vision is to lead Will in Canada. So we were very much just embracing of this is what we do and anybody who's in this fold should be part of this conversation right now. And it was really just more of a values-based decision of come along with us. And it wasn't until our last board meeting that we had the conversation of, okay, so at what point do we have to say, um, and if you're still coming along with us, at what point do you can, that you pay? So those that are paid members, 
are still paying uh, the membership. Our membership fee is, um, it, our membership structure has uh, caps on it because we do we deal with some large organizations. Uh, so when they stop paying at 20, for example, uh, for, it's unlimited membership after 20. But for those that aren't members, we just made this decision. And then we will make a decision out of the board if uh, those that will be able to, um, if they want to join us. And we kind of hope that it's the value that we provide in this community. I have received probably at least at least one, maybe two, three messages a day from people that are not um, part of Seawill, but that are messaging me, thanking me for opening this up. And I think that the value that they're seeing uh, out of it. And then for our associate, some of our members, they may be in a situation uh, that they might be hit hard by this financially. And uh, what they look at through their membership uh, going forward, but we're hearing that it's a membership that they can't have drop because they see the value in it. So um, our membership's not very expensive anyways. And for the value that it, that it does provide, we're just hoping that this community will allow that to continue to happen. So um, we're working through the details of the, I would say often that if that, then what? Um, the then what means, you know, making sure that we provide value for our members. But at this time, I think our whole community is happy to have anybody along and we'll make those decisions when it seems appropriate. It doesn't seem appropriate at this point to have the membership um, by doing a membership drive. Although I will say just one last point. When uh, basically what we've had is that through Redstone, uh, when people that aren't a member would like to join the uh, our Zoom call, so we do a, a weekly call at one o'clock on Mondays. Um, uh, and I joke that apparently it's my Mr. Rogers moment where I come to you live from this living room, uh, one o'clock on Mondays, and uh, we talk as a community about what is happening and some decisions we need to make. We've been pulling data, all of those kind of things. Um, so. What I uh, ask the Redstone team to do is if somebody does uh, register and they are not a member, that we at least uh, send them a, um, a, a link to our membership uh, information. So it's not a hard ask. It's just like, yeah, no thanks, thanks for joining us. Just so you know, this is what membership looks like, but you're welcomed into our community at this point. So we softly were doing that. And I think it's really important to understand where your members are at and how they feel about. And, and each industry, I think, is being hit in a different way through this. So you'll know the, the pulse of your members more than anybody else. I think that's great. Thank you so much, Leah. So moving on to another question that was submitted in advance. Do we have Janet Crawford on the line? Give her a moment just in case she's on mute. Janet, are you there with us? If not, I will go ahead and ask your question of the group. All right, so Janet had asked us, how can we replicate the value of in-person networking opportunities during COVID-19? Um, let's start with Alana. You, you mentioned your in-person event that happened this past week. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, maybe the platform that you use, some of the networking opportunities, and how you're continuing to facilitate that networking amongst the members of your organization during these times? Yeah, so the question was about networking. That's the question, right? Yeah, so I am tickled pink because we found, I think, the coolest platform ever. Uh, it was early to market. It's called Hopin, so you can write this out somewhere. H-O-P-I-N. They're doing an early adapters piece now. I thought it was a Toronto-based company, but it's actually an Ireland-based company. Um, and what I love about this platform is I think... Our mission is to give moms a great day, but our call to action at every event is to meet a new friend today, like meet one friend. Um, a lot of our moms who show up are, at our live events usually come so by themselves. And when a young mom <laughs> comes with her baby in hand to like a cool space and doesn't know anybody and they put their lipstick on and they're wearing jeans or whatever they did, like we want to make sure that they, they showed up analog, right? Like they showed up with their feet. Um, and we want to give them a great day. And it's not always easy 
to like in a conventional sense to create networking experiences and not everyone's a great networker and because we're not a professional based association the networking isn't necessarily like well we do wear name tags typically but it's not like a traditional ways to break the bread or break the conversation so our like call to action at events are make a new friend one new friend um so why hopin has been so integral in this and we're just sort of a toe into hopin just for those who might be experts in the in the actual platform already like a tech toronto who is one of the earlier adapters of it where i learned it from um what's been really remarkable about it is their networking platform and uh, the reason i'm so excited about it is because um if i could test drive it right now and be a salesperson for it i would but in essence it's a opportunity for people to connect one on one with multiple channels so if you sort of look at our you know brady brunch tile right now with 37 odd faces um that has oh my mom's on the call hi mom <laughs> just saw <her> face. <laughs> hi mom <laughs> uh, my mom's my biggest fan she's not even paying attention um so you know, what's great about Hopin is it allows you to have sort of a roulette wheel of one-on-one -on -one conversations and that sort of deep connection where it sort of pop up like me and Tristan would be having a call and be like, hey, Tristan, I'm Alana, what's up? Um, and it allows you to sort of get to know each other, you know, um, in that real one-on-one -on -one way. And what the feedback I got from my community is a lot of my moms are um, introverted, like they're not huge extroverts. So they even found this environment like super amazing because they find maybe sometimes they actually have a hard time breaking through in conversations so that roulette wheel of networking through this digital platform has given sort of i don't want to say wallflowers but women who perhaps are people who perhaps don't have the um wherewithal to always feel um like they have what to say or they have what to contribute or perhaps i often find in social dynamics and i'm super hyper aware of this you either have people who like are conversation dominators or people who don't get a word in edgewise and what allows um this to do is for you to sort of level the playing field and everyone has an opportunity to pass the mic it's a really cool piece i love that thank you Tristan, I wonder, and, and it's okay if the answer is no, but I wonder if because you come from the game environment and, you know, you're often inter interacting with, you know, the Facebooks and the Oculus Rifts and all of the high tech um, providers out there, are there other platforms um, that you've used to either facilitate networking or community or anything on the tech front that you can share with us? So uh, there, there's a lot of this, the normal, the standard platforms that we're using and that our communities are using, um, you know, the Facebook and all the social media channels. Um, Zoom is probably gone bonkers uh, with what's going on right now. Um, but then we've found, we've found some of our communities are doing some um, really creative stuff because in general, if you're in the game industry, you are probably also playing games. So they've kind of formed some of their own little niche communities through doing this. They've, you know, Animal Crossing New Horizon is uh, like just the popular game right now. And one of our chapters had a virtual meetup in the game. Um, you know, other games like World of Warcraft uh, and stuff like that, There, you know, people are getting together virtually around the world inside each other's games and just chatting and just finding a connection, even if it's not related to work and what they do, you know, as a game developer. Um, we also see a lot of game jams. So game jams are hackathons, but you're making games in 48 hours, um, but they're basically hackathons. Um, and uh those can be done from anywhere in the world so we're seeing a lot of those spring up right now um so that people can connect and you know the the, the fresh blood that you've mentioned can work on their skills since you know right now because we're a professional organization a lot of companies are not hiring um there's been a lot of layoffs and closures um so um, right now, and I'm sure this is across, I know this is across many industries. I know that my friends and family in the service industry are really being impacted by this as well. Um, but this, you know, even though, so the fresh blood, even though they're not necessarily able to get out there, they're able to work on things that they can add to their portfolio. You know, there's these, these opportunities that are being done. But then there's, um, you know, some of the more gamer, game-specific platforms, Discord, 
um, is pretty popular. Um, Twitch for live streaming um, and, you know, people just casually live streaming their games and then other people from around the world get together. They even do, um, you know, we're as an organization hosting virtual speakers and sessions like this um, on Twitch because that's where uh, that's where our community is. Um, you know, game industry people are on Twitch, game gamers are on Twitch. Um, and so those are probably the ones that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, yeah. Awesome, thank you. I've linked to almost everything that you mentioned. I know some won't be as applicable or relevant to some of the people on the call in with respect to, you know, having a meetup in a game. It sounds amazing and so futuristic and I conceptually don't even know what kind of development and tech uh, that would entail, but I know that it's very applicable to, um, to your industry and I think that it's amazing that the community that you serve is finding unique ways to, to make use of the technology that they have access to and that they know intimately. Um, yeah, Twitch is great, Discord also great. And a number of you on the call and others have asked um, my team about some of the platforms that we recommend. And there's a ton out there. There's no shortage of platforms for live streaming, rebroadcast, the Slacks, the, the WhatsApps, the, the everything. So if you have questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. We've done, I spend a, a lot of my time these days doing some research on what would work for, depending on what your goal is, there's no one size fits all. But um, yeah, there's some really, really amazing platforms out there that can be used for, for networking, community building, just staying in touch, um, you know, doing unique things with community, regardless of where you are in the world right now. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, for and I, to build on that, I think that for everyone, there is a big, so like Alana had mentioned that WhatsApp is really what worked for their community. Like finding, you have to kind of figure out, there may be trial and error, or maybe you already know, like what are the members of your community already using and will gravitate for. Um, I've seen a lot of people try to kind of just cast this wide net of being on every possible platform and product you can in order to try to reach everybody and it's that can be exhausting for you because if you if if 75 percent of your audience is on facebook and the other 25 is uh maybe those are the wrong percentages but and the other 25 percent is scattered amongst 50 other platforms you know where is the where is where are you going to reach the most people um especially when you're small staff so we're a very small staff so um it can it takes a lot of time to make sure even with the scheduling platforms out there to get our message across every single platform can be time consuming and overwhelming depending on what's going on. So um, yeah, so you don't have to be on everything and not everyone will fit every community's needs or wants. For sure, great point. And there's also a variety within any organization, uh, varying levels of comfort uh, with technology and new platforms and, and, you know, Zoom, like you said, it's exploding now, but there are still some people who this is new to them and first time users. And so you have to just be uh, mindful of, of, your, of your audience and, and their savviness. So I see that Diane, you've asked a question in the chat box. If you're comfortable, do you want to hop on the screen here and ask your, your question? I think this one is best suited for, for Alana at this point due to the market that she serves. Otherwise, I will ask, I will read it out. Here we go. Um, hi. Hi, um, welcome. Amazing content, and thank you for, uh, for, for doing this today. Um, so, so yes, my question is, I guess, especially for um, Alana, but would, well, maybe be for, uh, for all of you. I'm actually part of her uh, Mom Hello group, and I, I love uh, what she's doing. Uh, so the, the difference maybe that uh, she's targeting what uh, moms with a very young kids, and especially uh, during maternity leave, whereas I'm actually, well, uh, willing to target parents who are working now, who are juggling a business, so I guess like she is, uh, with young kids. And um, I always uh, find uh, issues on, uh, on pushing content, well, content or um, activities or planifications when I know that myself, I already don't have a time to actually have something set fixed during the, the week. Like um, it's, uh, I'm already like, mm, uh, like, for example, right now I have an hour, actually 45 minutes, uh, kids free, but uh, because my husband is there, but then he's going to work also and then uh, doing his own uh, with, uh, classes and, and courses. So, um, so, so, so yeah, so how do you actually, well, 
find a way to to provide some support but without adding some more stress to, to the people you are serving that's a hard one it is a hard one uh i'd let anyone from the panel of course and you carly of course jump in on this one look i don't know if i have a, a direct answer for this one yet diane because i think this is a really tricky one i find that there's two sorts of people in the world right now uh there's a people who are in the house board <laughs> and there's the people who have no time at all so um usually i'm not sure if you want to give me a show of hands if you're on camera but if you're a parent you don't have that much time right now <laughs> um and if you are, are are maybe somebody who perhaps has grown children or um somebody who is uh you know um uh not yet a parent or not interested in parent whatever you're not parent um it has seems to from TikTok tells me has a tremendous amount of time <laughs> available to them um so i think for you diane you have a very unique service and a very unique product and um I think you wanting to be there for working parents while you yourself are trying to juggle that is like you are your best customer. So put yourself exactly in the shoes of which those you serve and you know it's really hard. And I think when you don't have a fixed day and you have a flexible day, Diane, you know what would be a great solution for you? And I'm just going to, we'll just riff Diane, you and me. I would get a Zoom channel, I'd pay for it for the next three months and I would offer it up to all of my members and just have it open all day long and let them jump on it and you could be the provider of the zoom community and literally let anybody use your zoom channel if they are a member of working on some or if that's something you want to offer as a product or service um and i think carly is right i find it so interesting to see also two different types of people in the world people who are on zoom 15 times a day and people who have never yet heard of it so i think for you you have an opportunity to be a, a thought leader and saying we know you want flexibility and you could perhaps create 15 minute opportunity 15 minute workshops they don't need to be an hour long 10 15 minute pieces of wisdom at the top of each day bringing in experts or whatever but literally keep that zoom channel open all day for anybody who might want to use it themselves or perhaps have little huddles during the day think of it like a water cooler like everyone meeting around a water cooler in a physical office they can't do that but maybe that's what i would do i would just like open a channel and let it run free um, and that would be a really unique, I'm going to take that idea. No, I'm kidding. Um, I, that's a great idea for somebody like you in your industry. Yes, you. That's what I would do. It's just literally like understand the flexibility and just say that I can serve my community the best way by opening up a technology platform for them to sort of dabble all day long and you creating like bite size, like three minute, 15 minute pieces of knowledge or wisdom for how to manage this exact topic because this is why somebody would come for you, is to learn how to, as a solution-oriented company and business focused on helping parents who are independent workers, solo contractors, small and mighty, but with kids, that's exactly your call to action, and that's how I would use a digital platform right now. Awesome. Thank you for the idea. I will try that. Yeah, yeah I think that's, uh, that's great, and I don't know your business model, but I do think that everyone is in a similar boat right now, even if you, your kids are a little bit older, but we're all working from home, and if, and if you had help, um, maybe for you know, COVID reasons, they're not able to, to be with you, and so I think that all of us that do have kids or, or dependents, um, we're kind of doing, we're playing double duty all day long during the business day, um, you know, parenting and and trying to run it run this webinar right now um and whatever it is so what i will say in response to diane is that um like this session right now is over the lunch hour because if you're gonna be able to you know feed yourself um take a few minutes to yourself maybe this was, was the time to do it but you know what this doesn't work for everyone so what we do is we record it and then it will be a rebroadcast um to those who weren't able to so they can still engage with the content at a time that works for them and they can access it for access it for free and and long after this, the live session concludes so that's something that i would say and um yeah, and then they're free to engage with it as they want. I think also doing um, timings that would work for your community and asking them exactly what they need. So again, not knowing exactly what your business is, but some people work really well before the business day. So if you wanna do a, a sunrise meeting and if that works for your community, um, or you wanna do something after hours, I know that uh, one of our clients this evening, they're doing a, a virtual happy hour at 7 p.m. this evening because again, they have to work a full day or they're supposed to be working a nine to five and then they wanna have dinner with their, with their partner or what have you and then they wanna 
hop back on and have a sense of community. And so they're doing things off hours. And I'm almost seeing that, you know, your standard nine to five isn't really, um, in this time of COVID, I think anything goes. So I think that having a 7 p.m. business meeting, um, if, if that's something that your community would go for, you can try to, um, you can help facilitate that by just being flexible and, and open to what their needs really are. Amazing. Thank you very much for your answers. Just a random thought to riff off of what Elena said with the whole having the Zoom open um, all day and people can just kind of drop in. Um, I don't know if Zoom has a whiteboardish type of functionality at all, does yeah. it? Um, one of the things that I really like in Animal Crossing is so like right now I have the, my Animal Crossing world open and people are coming in and out even though I'm working. <laughs> um, but there is a bulletin board where people can leave messages to me on it. And so if, if you try something like that where you have just a constantly open thing, you, and then there's the ability to have a whiteboard, like, ha, you know, have people come in and like leave notes or jot down ideas and then they can riff off each other and then maybe they're popping in and out throughout the day when they have a chance um, and they can see if anybody's left anything for them when they pop back in two hours later when they found five minutes to check in um, that you know that's just kind of kind of riffing off of what Elena had mentioned there I'm just thinking of it on, on, on another kind of thought on this is that like we're dealing with uh, with Seawill, we have very uh, institutions and organizations that are tend to be uh, very structured. So, uh, and then on top of that, we're a national organization, which is bilingual. Uh, we have to be, so there's also taking that into consideration. And then also the time zone differences across the, the country. On top of that, that we have people that have young families, uh, you know, uh, caregivers. Um, I would say that, uh, um, and then there's also on the my more of my Brock side. I manage a team of over 50 people. I have uh, uh, senior level managers that report to me. One. who has a newborn, uh, basically a year old and a three year old and her nanny was not, no longer allowed to, um, uh, to work with her. So it's interesting and I, I, I very much, I read this article about like, while we're all in the same storm, we're not in the same boat. And I don't know if you read this, but I feel like it was one of those ones that for me is you know I'm working 15 hours a day I've got two young children I've got and everybody's story is very different so as an association you're trying to manage that or as a business whichever lens you're going to look at it from so it, it, it's very similar to me to an integrated marketing plan there has to be a lot of integrations and how you you go about it so it's not always just one single thing although one thing may be stronger than the other but how you develop um, or how you think about how things work together in systems so yes we have our one o'clock call because that works for the west coast it works for the east coast it works for central and then we have somebody taking minutes so they can post that then we didn't have a linkedin group that was um a, it's so much a more of like a chat function where we were having a repository so we built that really quickly and literally on a call somebody's like okay hey, i'm building it right now and we're like okay here's the link okay the link is there now everybody jump on there and because we we're looking at it from you know resources like what this university built or what this organization built and we're able to post those things and kind of like you're just was talking about the whiteboard idea but it was on a very structured um, in, in, in some ways we're trying to find a safe place too that people could very quickly share information and then also feel like if they talk about their strategy that it's not going to be wide open to everybody, especially as you're dealing with populations, vulnerable populations, populations of people just wanting to share some information. So that LinkedIn group has become something that's been building on the side as well as these calls, as well as our website, as well as the FAQ. So it is almost like an integrated plan that was that was building as we were going because we were dealing with these you know we have such a wide array of people that are in the storm with us and they're all in a different boat so how do we service them and then on top of that in two official languages which has also been uh interesting for us so okay thank you thank you very much
Amazing. Thank you. So we have a couple of other questions that were posed in advance and also that came through just to me directly throughout, but I am mindful of everybody's time. So I'm going to uh, get back to those people whose questions we didn't answer, but I'm going to give it over to the speakers one last time to give final thoughts, wrap up, um, any words of wisdom or leaving us with an inspirational thought. 